from the meantime. <laughs> Okay. Go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm talking a little bit about what we do with microservices at Cardigo. So before I start, I got to ask um, who is not familiar with Cardigo. So I explain it a little. No one. Okay. That's awesome to hear. Just for me, because I'm interested. Who uses Cardigo? Or a couple. Okay. <laughs> who wants to? Oh, we can't provide that, but we try. Let's, let's see. Okay, uh, then I don't have to talk a lot about Cardigo itself. That's good. Uh, my name is Sumit Kumar. Um, some of you maybe you know recognize a pattern here, and I probably don't have to tell you where I, where you can find me. But um, I'm a lead developer here regarding JavaScript. I started uh, 2003 on the front end side, and as soon as uh, you know Node.js hit, I was abandoning PHP as fast as I could and uh, started with that. And um, currently, I'm not coding as much as I would, mo mainly open source or in, um, let's say, pet project and proof of concepts. But other than that, I'm responsible here for uh, architecture and getting different teams on the same line um, Yeah, regarding the applications and the microservices. So um, I will tell you a little bit um, about what we solve with microservices. So it's a real problem that we have and that we try to solve, and that is fleet management and distribution. Um, as you know, car to go, we got a lot of cars, and uh, let's take, for example, Hamburg. Um, all these cars here need to be distributed so you can use them. M the people who use car to go here will probably know that, you know, sometimes it's really frustrating because you don't find a car to go, or it's not there when you need it, and that is the distribution part, so we need to bring the cars where they are needed, we need to calculate where they are needed next, in an hour, in a day, and whatnot. So it's a prediction uh, problem. And the management stuff is about maintainability. So they need to be fueled, they need to be repaired, uh, upgraded, branded, blah, 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 stuff like that. Um, this is basically the big problem. And in the past, we would probably have written a big Java monolith, uh, which means um, you know all the data in there, eight years development, and um, total chaos after. And if you get new developers, they will quit when they see the code. So that is something we don't want. That is not scalable. That is not something um, you know that is modern or in any way uh, currently, let's say, acceptable, especially for you guys from the Node uh, community. Um, so we wanted to solve that problem. And the first uh, thing we had to do there is slicing the microservices. Um, I put there it's a religion because we had lots of discussions about that. Everybody has a different opinion because the main question is how micro is micro really? How big can a microservice be? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Netflix talk from the, I don't know, CTO there or VP of engineering. He was a great help for us because they already did the mistake for us uh, that we wanted to avoid. And that is making your microservices really, really, really micro. So they had like thousands of microservices and management from that was a pain. Um, you didn't know, you know who, what is where and how to maintain it and everything. So they overdid it a little, um, but also you don't want to create five monoliths or something. So uh, we first looked at a problem and started to um, separate this problem into components. Um, if we look at this real-world problem, distribution and uh, maintainability, we find a couple of components uh, that would be in this huge monolith, which is the car data itself. So every single detail about a car, which is massive, uh, I'm talking about not only the plate, I'm talking about pins of the SIM cards that are in the cars, immobilizer codes to turn off the car remotely or you know, starting it again. Um, I'm talking about financial data, how much should it cost, and uh, how big is the leasing equipment, what navigation system is in there, and stuff like that. So it's a lot of data. Then we have the issues. What is wrong with the car currently? Does it have a scratch? Uh, is the tire pressure low? Uh, not enough fuel? Is the branding still wrong? Um, did somebody puke in it? Hope you don't do that, or, or smoke in it, or whatever. These are all issues. Then we have, of course, user management, our employees, our external um, Vendors, it's here uh, as well. So uh, service guys and girls who bring the cars where they should be, workshops and stuff like that. 
We got task management. Um, that is basically do this with the car or bring it from A to B. This is different to issues because let's say uh, we have an issue, someone puked in the car and you have um, a dirty mat in it. It will only create one task and that is clean it, right? So uh, that is the difference here. Uh, this is where we would log all the issues and this is where what needs to be done. Um, also, there are some tasks that are not in the issues and this is related to demand and algorithm. So for example, uh, the car is, I don't know Hamburg that well, so let's say it's in an outer skirt somewhere. Uh, all the way away from the uh, inner, from, from the city center. And we need it in the, in, in the city center um, because there are a lot of people that want to use that car. It would create a task, uh, bring that car from the outside to the, to the inner city, um, but it's not an issue with the car itself. Then we have renders, I already talked about that. And then we have demand algorithms, routing. This is stuff, um, demand prediction and uh, real-time demand. That is when you open the app, we have basically a demand, except if you want to check your uh, account settings or whatever. Um, we also have demand prediction. So we know there is a concert there and it's starting to rain. Probability is pretty high that we will get demand in that area. Um, and lots of lots of other data uh, into that. Algorithms calculating all the time, where are the cars, where should they be, in what time and stuff. So these are let's say stateless algorithms, um, they don't have a database, they don't have, a, they may have a cache, but they are constantly calculating and pushing out the data. Uh, routing, um, so if we have to relocate, let's say 100 cars and we have 10 people that do that, what is the most efficient route throughout the city so they can relocate as much cars as possible in the shortest time possible. Uh, this calculation is, ridiculously expensive. It was done at, uh, by I, I don't, I, master thesis or PhD two at, in Munich. And um, let's say it, the, the, the calculation itself took like 15 minutes. So we did a request to the backend there. It took 15 minutes and then returned uh, what was happening there. So that was a totally ridiculous uh, calculation. Obviously these were PhDs, they were good in math, probably not in programming. So we uh, might can, you know, uh, optimize that a little bit, but that is, for example, a problem we, we still working on. And coordinate data, uh, simply because Cardigo lives from, you know, location. So where are the cars? Where are the users? What is the city, uh, the business area and everything, the parking spots, the, the fuel stations, um, gas stations. So we got lots of coordinate data that needs to be managed. So these are um, a couple of components inside that problem. There are a couple more. Um, I just didn't recognize them right now. So, oops, sorry. Um, then we got a couple common services that you all know. You, if you are working in production with microservices, as some of you do, you probably had these problems uh, and written them five times or something before you created a dedicated microservice for all of them. That is authentication, API key management. So backend to backend communication is easy. Logging uh, is something that if you have 100 developers building microservices, it's not something they should care about anymore. Uh, history, as soon as you start um, changing key data, for example, from the car, the plate updates or something, um, that needs to be locked somewhere. Uh, and, you know, there are requests or necessary requests. So we look at what was the fleet a year ago, um, the cost of it, the plates and everything. So proper history, historization was necessary. Of course, monitoring and uh, front-end serving. So all the front-ends, they don't have, or front-end developers should um, not have to build their own uh, microservice that, you know, serves them. And they should not be included in the, sorry, in the um, repository as well. We wanted to, if we have to change a server that serves a static website or a single page application, uh, we wanted to change that server for all applications. And that's mostly because of authentication or, um, for example, cores and stuff like that. Um, of course, there are others. I forgot the dot, dot, dot here, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of common services that we have to build there as well. And uh, the most difficult part, if you're having, like we listed, I don't know, 50 microservices already. If you have that, and uh, I'm only describing one problem here and we have a hundred or something, then the biggest difficulty is naming them. That is by far the 
the most difficult part, and uh, you hear that in the other talk as well, that is something we continuously uh, fight over. Um, and there are some ridiculous name com names coming up co already. Um, just an example, a microservice that takes care of opening the car, which means you send it, you send to an, to an API um, route, you just send a vehicle ID, and then it opens that car up. So pretty simple, very micro, and that is currently named Sesame, so it's Sesame open and the car. Uh, so just because uh, the people, you know, like it, and um, I think it was a nice idea, so we do it. Uh, but And also, you know, naming them is the hardest part. So, um, there is something, oh yeah, here, deployment and pipeline. So, uh, well, maybe I forgot some, some stuff here. I should show you the actual microservices that we have here for that problem or at least a few of them. So uh, you will see a lot of, let's say, ab uh, abbreviations right now that don't make sense to you. I will explain some of them. And uh, this is a chart that currently uh, explains a problem. I can zoom, I think. I think there's even a presentation mode and stuff, but I don't know the tool good enough. So FMM ecosystem, what the hell is that? It stands for fleet management, uh, fleet management module, I think. I didn't name that. Um, and the ecosystem just means these are the microservices that solve the problem for this. We built all microservices that I can use um, throughout the company. So one microservice, for example, Keycloak, is our authentication microservice. It's an open source um, solution. Zoom a little bit, okay. Um, the Keycloak service, better? Uh, is something, uh, it's an open source solution, so it's not really built by us or anything, um, just as an example. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's used by every other microservice, and uh, we got a couple of others here that are used on other ecosystems, other problems that need to be solved. So we try to do every microservice as generic as possible, and if not, we prefix it with, uh, for example, here, the, the ecosystem. So it's specifically for that ecosystem. Um, okay, so let's look at it. We start at the front end because we have users that need to do something. Uh, that is the FMM front end. It basically aggregates data uh, from different sources, shows it to the user, and displays actions uh, on it. Um, Behind that are a couple microservices, two of which are displayed here. User management, it's pretty clear, I think. It goes to our uh, authentication mechanism with all the users and everything, and to API key management. Um, why API key management? Keycloak, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Again, it's an open source library, a pretty big one, but it doesn't support uh, API, key, uh, API keys out of the box. Um, so we build the microservices for all others that um, yeah, that, that uh, combines to Keycloak, uh, combines with Keycloak. Why is that? Because our API keys need to be connected to a user. So if our one of our backends gets spammed um, because somebody built a loop and deployed it and didn't remove it, and it, it spams our API and causes trouble or whatever, we can take a look, call this guy and tell them, you know, what the hell is going on? You drunk or remove that loop? So um, we need to have some affiliation here. User management, vendor management, I, I told you these are service uh, employees from uh, external ones and users are our uh, own employees here. And then we have the task service. Um, I'm going from top to bottom, so the front end only asks for give me the tasks for these vehicles or any tasks. So um, in there could be, for example, drive the car from A to B, drive the car to a workshop, drive the car to a gas station, stuff like that. Um, then we have the task engine. That is much more complicated because the task engine is something that automatically creates tasks. So today's cars are connected or mostly connected, which means, for example, a Mercedes-Benz has an API, the, the car itself, that we can query and it gives us like 200 properties, tire pressure, uh, the fuel level, um, the current da dashboard, what's what's displayed there and everything. So the state of the car is basically um, available via an API. And 
this task engine automatically creates tasks. Now, this is something you may could put in there, but then you would have custom logic in there. So this has very a lot of custom logic depending on the data that, that arrives to it. And if you put it in here, uh, this task service would, would not be available or in a hard way available to other developers, other, other departments, people that solve other problems. Like just as an, as an example, let's say somebody wants to rebuild Jira for us for whatever reason or Wunderlist. They could use this task service because it has all the functionality of cars. But if we put algorithms in there that calculate stuff based on data that comes in and stuff, so you're mixing uh, the the use cases here, and it would create a lot of problems. So this service is pretty stupid. It's an HTTP CRUD REST API. You can just create uh, tasks and get them and everything and search them. And um, the, the calculation goes on in a different microservice that, that needs to run all the time, and it's not idling or whatever. It just calculates based on the data. So what data comes in here, car issuer, these are the issues that, uh, that I talked about before. Um, that means what is wrong with the car. Then we have the demand calculation and the routing. I um, said what these are in the beginning. Um, it's the most efficient routing and demand calculation is basically where do we need the cars and when. Um, all this gets in there and even more stuff. Um, and the, what does it need to calculate? The car issuer will tell it the car, the tire pressure is low, drive it to a workshop to you know fix that. This demand calculation will tell it drive that car from the outer skirt to the inner skirt. So what takes precedence here? There are two requests to drive the car somewhere um, right now, and it's different locations. So this task engine, based on you know a lot of different uh, input, creates a priority of these tasks um, and then automatically creates them in the tasks service here, of course. So um, these are all microservices as well. And again, all of these have the different ecosystem. So what I'm showing you here is the FMM ecosystem that is handled by one team, one JavaScript Scrum team, basically, two front-end developers, four back-end developers. Um, all these blue ones are handled by them. And these, for example, this is a service from another team, and it has its own ecosystem around it. Right? It's just one service that is called here, but obviously it has a front end, it has data input as well, it has the car API uh, that serves the data, and so on and so on. Um, and the other ones as well. So if we just take a small look, for example, the car issuer is then used in this ecosystem. I'm not zooming because I'm going over it shortly, uh, very shortly. Car issuer it has the front end, these are the ones we just saw, the task uh, things. This is a service from an external supplier that, uh, you know, when you call the hotline of Car2Go, um, you will, you know, reach someone and they work on this tool, in this tool, it's external. Um, issue reporting is when you go into the app and say, well, my car is dirty, I accidentally puke, then it goes into that. And uh, then we have asset management and the car, the, the vehicle data, uh, asset management is obvious uh, if you you know, drive against another car, you have to call the police, they will give you forums and photos and whatnot, and this gets uploaded there. So um, that is basically uh, what we then, you know, wanted to do or want to do or did. Uh, these microservices, they are not all finished yet, but, um, you know, we are currently on it. And um, if you have built them, or if you built, um, let's say we put out a proof of concept of all these microservices and you have the basic um, flow running and uh, they communicate to each other in one way or, not, or another, and you can you know, um, try out the use case, then you get the real interesting problems. Um, the first one is the pipeline. It's pretty, oops, I have to go to this one. Uh, it's pretty, uh, basic for us, I think you all um, know the tools here that we use. I think it's not much uh, customization. We got GitLab and GitLab CI for hosting and uh, deploying. At least the tools I showed you, of course, Cardigo is big. We have lots of developers. There are other tools in use, um, but most of them I don't want to touch. So we are working with this currently. Uh, we have automated tests uh, inside that application. I think most of you working in production have that too. Unit uh, tests, integration tests, E2E, monkey testing. That is the interesting stuff, like just 
put down one service and see how the, the whole ecosystem reacts. Um, and then logging and monitoring, obviously. Um, logging and monitoring is not something that happens in the pipeline, so I maybe should put that out of here. Uh, the deployment stuff, uh, we are putting everything in Docker. There is not a single application um, for our Node.js teams that don't work in Docker or that don't have Docker. Uh, we use Kubernetes to orchestrate all these Docker containers um, so we can, you know, I don't know if you know the advantages. Has anyone worked with Kubernetes or Docker Swarm? One, two, okay, not that much. Um, the, the, the big features here that we are using is, for example, rolling updates. So if we have a new application um, and we have 10 instances of that, it has load balancing and everything. So if we get, uh, if we get lots of requests, it gets auto-scaled. Let's say we have 10 instances and if we update one, it updates one of them, then the second one. So you have like 10% of the users get the new one, then 20 and so on and so on. You have no downtime and you can also roll back as soon as you find errors. So if the first instance get, gets updated, there would be already errors thrown in the monitoring and stuff. So you like 10% of the users are affected, but you already see that something is wrong. You stop the deployment and um, roll back, which is pretty easy with Docker. You just deploy the old image. Where do we deploy to? IBM SoftLayer, uh, not a very popular cloud, not popular here as well, but uh, we have it. And uh, we are currently switching to AWS. So we got a couple microservice ecosystems running there already and we'll continue to move over. Heroku and Zeit, uh, or Now is the tool that they have. It's called Now. Um, they are for let's say pet project. So if we got working students or developers in their 10% um, private project time or open source or whatever, they don't want to hassle a lot with pipelines and whatnot and what we, the, the big setup, they just want to deploy and look if it's working. And this is where Heroku and now comes in and um, can quickly test something. Obviously these are public uh, Heroku inside. So if they deploy something there, the rule is, you know, don't put the key card pins in there or something. So no sensitive data or your home address or anything. Um, then after that, if we have deployed it and it runs and everything is cool, um, how do you know it's cool? It's monitoring and health. So um, we have different solutions here. There are different let's say, layers that you need to monitor. The first one is the big one. That's uh, basically our servers and everything. It's, we use Datadog uh, for that. You can use all kinds of stuff, but Datadog impressed us. Um, and we have, uh, yeah, pretty nice dashboards there for um, everything server or infrastructure related and alerts, obviously, in our chat tools and, um, you know, dashboards in the office so uh, we can shame the developers if something is red, which is important and fun. Uh, then we got client-side error logging, um, so your front ends and your applications, uh, if they crash or have an error, we need to see that. The tools there are TrackJS and Sentry. Um, you use here something different. Where is the iOS developer? What's your client-side error logging thing called again? You don't know? You showed it to me. I don't know, uh, whatever. We use Sentry on the front end. I don't know what the apps currently use. Um, logging, uh, we use the Elk stack, so Elasticsearch, Log, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, basically, it's different dashboards. Would be cool if we could, uh, you know, find one solution there, but big company, different teams come up with different solutions. So um, there is always a, a big, let's say, ecosystem of different technologies. Uh, integrations into Slack and MetaMouse, the chat tools we currently use. We also have HipChat, but, you know, Fuck it, doesn't work. Um, then we have the Kubernetes health checks. Uh, Kubernetes itself has um, a functionality that just pings a health endpoint of each pod. Pods are where the Docker container runs in and in there your application runs. So it just uh, asks for how healthy are you and your application just responds, I'm connected to the database and you know everything is okay. And the API monitoring, obviously. Um, ping me, please, if you have cool tools to do that because we, or in the past, we used RunScope. RunScope is pretty awesome if you have ever used it or not. Um, 
to do API monitoring, but it's only available public hosted. And if we would do API monitoring with that tool, obviously that tool would have ev all data we have, which is not good. So we need a self-hosted solution here and we haven't found one yet. So um, we are open about this one. And uh, other than that, with this tool, we currently just check um, if the API is up and if there is something common to it. But uh, we have like, let's say, mock uh, endpoints that don't serve real data for it. Um, yeah, because we can't put that into different companies, that data. Um, okay, what could possibly come after that when you deploy your microservice, it's working and you, um, you know, you know it's up, you have the monitoring and you can sleep uh, without having one eye open and nobody calls you. Um, re rewriting and refactoring. Obviously, when we write microservices, we suck and next year we are better and the year after we are even better and better and not everything changes. So, um, this is something we don't, we can't ignore. We can't tell the POs or the management that we never rewrite. It's just how software works. And um, yeah, what's the biggest reason? The biggest reason is new tech. It's not that the old one is not working. It's because the developers come to the management and say, well, you know, there is this cool new framework. I got to try that and the new API and whatever. So what comes new frameworks? If you look at the front end, it's basically every two weeks where we got something new. If you look at Node.js, we may come over a year or something with the same one. Um, if we look at APIs, uh, HTTP REST, the biggest one, obviously, we have uh, a lot of that too. I partially agree with, my, uh, with the previous uh, talk that HTTP is, let's say, not suitable for everything. We have lots of real-time data that's happening here. This needs to be served via uh, queues. So it's basically this back-end to back-end communication. We use queues or webhooks um, to serve real-time data. But uh, let's say the car data again, which is a massive load of data for like 14,000 cars. Uh, if you want to fetch that, a queue will not work. You, uh, you have to query that in pieces um, via GraphQL or HTTP REST or whatever, um, or it's more convenient for the developers. We also got WebSockets, obviously, that is mostly used for um, socket connections to front ends if they have to serve some real-time dashboards or whatever. Um, then databases, even that changes sometimes. So uh, I don't know if you use DB2 or something. Uh, very old, very old. And uh, we still have that somewhere. I'm ashamed to say that, but we do. And uh, developers obviously come to us as well and say, well, you know, there is a new database, uh, whatever, in, in AWS um, that I want to try. And then uh, with microservices, we have this possibility that we say, okay, don't rewrite everything. Here's a proof of concept or a new microservice. Try out the new stuff. Uh, put, make it small. We see if it works. And if it works, cool. If not, throw it away, rewrite it. Um, there are rules circling around the community. You, a microservice is micro if you can rewrite it in one day, one week, one month. Uh, there are different, um, I hear it a lot uh, regarding that. I'm not a fan of rewriting on one day because if you need one day to do a microservice, um, you know, I don't know what, what it does, but it doesn't do, it doesn't solve these problems, um, at least not for us. So our goal is a month or uh, a few weeks. Currently, depends on how many developers, of course. Um, but we got big microservices sometimes, and sometimes small ones, and the big ones should be uh, rewritable in a few weeks. App structure. Um, this is maybe not something that is changing a lot. There are best practices that are coming into the community from, from open source developers, from uh, big companies that, you know, that uh, do conference talks and everything. They have new concepts, they, they show them. Um, it's mostly, again, developers that say, oh, I got a different idea, or this current one sucks, the naming scheme sucks, I want to refactor it and uh, try a new structure, um, and they can do so. Ev either I can show you how they do it, we introduce text prints, or we just lie to the PO 
If the PO says, uh, well, you know, we have a new feature, uh, yeah, that's implemented, that we say, oh, ooh, we need like, I don't know, we need probably one and a half weeks for it. You know you only need a day, but the rest you refactor something else that uh, you know is necessary. No POs here, I hope, from us. Um, but other than that, we also introduced some text prints uh, in some teams, which means like every fifth sprint um, is the PO has to shut up and the developers can uh, create their own stories, uh, what they think is necessary, what they think uh, needs to be refactored, rewritten, different tech in there, different library, whatever. They can do whatever they want uh, simply to make them happy, to make the code maintainable, the application maintainable, and to ensure that the tech in there is future-proof, which the PO mostly can't uh, judge. So, um, that's how we do it. And if I didn't forget anything, if we follow all these things, our microservices hopefully should uh, live a pretty long and happy life and opens the car for you when it's needed. And that's it from my side. Thanks. Should I answer questions? Are there questions? Okay. Private questions. <laughs>